Hey everyone, welcome to this video in the Katie Explained series. Today we're going to be looking at the top 10 API bugs. So OWASP published this uh, top 10 list of security vulnerabilities. There is now, as of like a few months ago, an API version. Uh, but I wanted to go through the list and talk about, you know, the bugs that are there, how you find them and how you can exploit them. So this is really a short video just talking about this list of the top 10 bugs and APIs. Next week we're going to be doing API enumeration. So I really hope this video will provide a kind of here's the bugs you should look for while that video will then do the um, kind of here's how you can find the API endpoints. So we're going to be looking at this list. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just the top 10 list. Uh, and once again, this video is sponsored by Integrity. So if you haven't seen any of my other videos, you won't necessarily know, but Integrity is very kindly offered to sponsor some videos on my channel. Um, if you're not really aware of them, they're a smaller kind of bug bounty platform, you know, like HackerOne and BugCrowd. They focus more on European customers. They're definitely smaller, but actually that's quite a good advantage because they're super active on social media, replied to hackers, always interacting with the community. They have a really wide range of targets to look at that you won't find on other platforms, um, especially considering that the amount of active hackers is a lot lower, so you actually have quite a good competition there. Um, plus, they run XSS challenges for you to test your skills, and they also have prizes for that as well. They have um, but professional licenses. Um, but you know me. I'm all about community focus uh, and actually Integrity are really giving back to the community by not just sponsoring my videos but sponsoring other videos, sponsoring newsletters and even more content. And they're actually letting me create the content that I want to make. They're not pushing me to make focused content or mention them a lot um, and that's really good for me because I don't take having a sponsor lightly. I think it's quite important that when I recommend something to you all <clears throat> That it's something good, right? Um, so I carefully considered this. I really do like the platform. They do amazing things for the bug bounty community. If you're not already a member, you can sign up with the link on screen, which is go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. Um, and actually, some of you guys have already started doing it. And I've heard from a few of you, you found your first bug or you're finding a lot of bugs on Integrity. And I'm so pleased with you. I'm so happy you found your first bug. Um, please do tell me if you do find your first bug on Integrity or any platform. I really do want to celebrate when you folks find stuff. But for the people that found stuff Integrity, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad. It's great. Um, and having this sponsorship really lets me invest more into the channel. So please do give them some love. Sign up. You know, maybe you'll find your first bug too. So I'm promoting them because I think you provide something great. And you can sign up with go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. So now we're out of the way, let's talk about API hacking, which is one of my favorite topics. I think APIs are one of the best sources for bugs now in 2020. Um, I really want you to check out this video first, because before you watch this, you really need to know what an API is. You should have some idea of how they're used. Um, and if you really don't understand yet, you can check out this video in the Finding Your First Bug series that goes all over the basics. But APIs are bloody fantastic at the moment for getting bugs. So what bugs are there? So I spoke a little bit about this in this video. This is much more in depth. So, oh, whoops. So what is the API security top 10? So this is a API security project in OWASP. Um, and they, OWASP, if you don't already know, it's a community project for security professionals. They publish top 10 security vulnerabilities. And then within this, this is like a sub community which created the AI security project, which then publishes the top 10 bugs of only APIs. So let's have a look at them. Oh God, they're written in legalese. Uh, yes, I understand some of these words. So we have broken object level authorization broken user authentication, blah, 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 blah. It's really, really corporate. It's very much for the blue team, the other side, the people securing the apps, not necessarily for us. But you know what? This list is really good for bug bounty hunters. It's in the language of the defenders. And you know, some of these might not be a security risk in terms of how we would see like a bug, especially because we've got stuff in there talking about 
um, security misconfiguration, which may not actually be an issue a lot of the time, or insufficient logging, which is again a really low impact issue, which you wouldn't usually have a bug bounty for. Um, and you know what? Let's talk about what these bugs are, but in our language, and especially looking at how we can find and test for these bugs. So. Uh, let's go through them. This is every bug in the OWASP a API top 10 explained for bug bounty hunters, not for blue team security people. So API 1, 2019, broken object level authorization. APIs tend to expose endpoints that handle object identifiers, creating a wide attack surface. Level access control issue. Object level authorization check should be considered in every function that accesses a data source using an input from the user what so let's go through this what does it mean it's actually just talking about an idor insecure direct object reference so if you're not really aware of what an idor is i have an entire video on them but it's basically when you can access somebody else's data by just changing an id so let's say you're a user and you can change your own email address because you're that user but if you just change like a user ID parameter to a different user ID, you can change somebody else's email address, for example. Um, it's really that the API isn't checking that you own a resource before you do something to it. So what should you really be keeping an eye out to find this bug? The first is any kind of ID, you know, numeric, UUIDs, anything that looks suspiciously like an ID. Um, and these are particularly common in RESTful APIs. So RESTful APIs are these APIs that tend to follow this kind of structure. Um, once again, API video goes over that completely. IDOR video for more information on IDORs. But okay, how do you find that ID? Uh, that bug, sorry. When you see an endpoint with an ID, you want to remove all of the cookies and see if the endpoint still works. Now, the point of that is just to very quickly kind of do a, a litmus test, if you like where removing the cookies is something really easy to do in something like Burp, where you can just send the request and you don't need to mess around with having multiple accounts. If it doesn't work, you then need to start playing around multiple accounts and seeing if um, you can replace user A's cookies with user B's cookies and see if you could still do something to user A's account. Um, again, IDOR video goes over it in much more detail. So API 2 broken user authentication. Authentication mechanisms are often implemented incorrectly, allowing attackers to compromise authentication tokens or exploit implementation flaws to assume other users' identities temporarily or permanently. Well, that is quite a sentence. Compromising systems' ability to identify the client slash user compromise API security overall. So what on earth does that mean? Well, it means an API should have some form of authentication, but it doesn't, or its authentication is weak in some way that you can generate authentication tokens for other users, for example, um, or it's about API keys not being secure. When they say, um, assume the role, let me just get my little uh, laser pointer. When it says, um, assume other users identities temporarily what it's basically saying is that you can log in as somebody um so what are the signs of this bug well if you want to find api keys for internal apis google dorking is great getting into github is great it's really useful to not just stop when you find something like a google maps api key but to go a little bit further and see if you can find inter references to internal apis because even if you might not be able to access it as a user, if you have the API key, you actually have a ton of control and that can be a really high severity bug. The second one is APIs which generate some form of token without securing it. So when we say some kind of token, we're really looking at kind of login tokens. Could you log in as somebody else? Um, it's really important when you're testing to test a login functionality because you'd think it'd be the first thing people would secure. But often you can find like a really easy bugs to just log in as somebody else. Um, so how do you find it? Google Dorking to find API keys. There's a really great talk um, about recon that I'll link below that covers how to do Google Dorking. Um, I'm also going to have some videos coming out, but later in the future. Uh, the second one is recon to find internal APIs, which might take certain keys. Um, 
this is great to test internal APIs and find even more bugs, especially because if you think about it, if you're a developer and you've got an external API, that's the one you secure. If you've got something internal, you're like, yeah, no one's ever going to find this. It's fine. Again, test login systems, especially for password reset, token generation. Those, if you use like a mobile app where you're almost always interacting with an API, they can be really insecure. So definitely worth checking them out. I saw API 3, 2019, excessive data exposure. Um, looking forward to, imp to generic implementation, developers tend to expose, expose all object properties without consideration of the individual sensitivity, relying on clients to perform the data filtering before displaying it to the user. Um, so we know a lot about excessive data exposure really like we call it information disclosure and it's really when an API returns too much info that it really doesn't need to so you might have an API that returns um, personal information you might have an API that returns a bunch of like user information for stuff like recon and further bugs um, you might have something that you can uh, manipulate in some way to get uh, more information out let's say you know someone's name you can get their address for example so it's not just hey this endpoint returns all the users names it's then going that extra step and going what does that allow me to do so what are really the signs of this bug you should always be keeping an, an eye out for endpoints that return a ton of stuff as soon as you see like your burp window full of json you should be staring at it to figure out what is actually returning now it's not necessarily a bug when you just get a bunch of information back because it can be kind of benign information. But you really have to make a kind of decision here of, you know, is this confidential? Should this be secure? Um, is it something that I would want secure if I was a developer? If you click one button and one piece of data comes up, but actually the API is returning like a thousand lines, that is nearly always a kind of information disclosure. So how do you find information disclosure? Well, you can do an API enumerations, press buttons. Your general goal is to find API endpoints that you not, wouldn't normally hit. Now, the reason why you wouldn't normally hit them is really just because they tend to be more secure if people know about them. But being sitting there and just, you know, if people are dealing with a forum, they're going create post, edit post, delete post, they're not necessarily going, okay, can I change, um, what about user details, right? What about the reporting functionality? It's really going that kind of extra step. Um, and really you have to make a judgment call when it comes to uh, information disclosure, excessive data exposure. You have to decide whether or not the information that's being returned is a risk. Fundamentally, that's kind of your call. Um, and I know it's quite a difficult call to make. So I have a video on my original API video that goes into more detail about data exposure um, and what you can kind of do about it. So API 4 2019, lack of resources and rate limiting. This has got the wrong description on it, but it's rate limiting, it's fine. Um, so what does it mean? What is rate limiting? It means you can DOS an API because it doesn't limit the amount of requests you can do. So a lot of the time you will be limited to do five requests a day or 10 requests a day because if you overload a server with requests, you can really start one to cause issues like in um, stopping service for other people, but also, especially if you're dealing with something that's like internal that um, maybe gets deployed, um, you could probably, as a malicious actor, be able to take something completely off the network. And actually, kind of more interestingly, you can brute force information from an API. If you've got a logon functionality and you don't know someone's password, if there's rate limiting, if there's no rate limiting on it, you can just keep hitting that with like every single password, maybe from the top password list, and go again and again and again and again and again, and hopefully you find something. Um, so what are those kind of signs of this bug? It can be really difficult to spot. Like it is not something that you will necessarily be able to see. Um, usually you spot it when you're kind of doing a recon activity because during recon you send a ton of requests. Um, but even if it doesn't have, if it doesn't have rate limiting, you're still sitting there to try and figure out like, 
okay, this doesn't have rate limiting, but is that actually a risk and what you can do with the lack of rate limiting? So if you kind of don't, if, if that works, that's usually a sign. Um, and really you want to use this to find another bug, like use it another attack. So if an API requires an ID, lack of rate limiting will allow you to just keep testing an endpoint until one works. Especially if you're dealing with UUIDs, often people will say, oh, there's no security risk because it's difficult, like you wouldn't be able to carry on, like guess the next one. But actually, if there's lack of rate limiting, you can just keep brute forcing them until you find something. So it can quite often be used to kind of escalate a bug to be a little bit better. Um, so API 5 2019, broken function level authorization. Complex access control policies with different hierarchies, groups and roles and an unclear separation between administrative and regular functions tend to lead to authorization flaws. By exploiting these issues, attackers gain access to other users' resources and administrator functions. Uh, this is a permission idol. Uh, it's when you have a user and an admin and you don't check the user's um, uh, level, whether or not they're a admin or a user when you do an admin function. So I talk really at in depth about these on my IDOR video again, but essentially you want to look for any kind of complex permissions. So anytime you have, say, a use an admin and a user and a guest those are great for testing these um any kind of ids ids are always like keep an eye out for them so how do you find it um i recommend using containers in firefox see that video we're getting to a point in my videos now where i'm now citing my other videos as sources but you can use that to log into multiple accounts at the same time and get everything sent to a uh, but so create an admin account, create a user account, have them logged in, and then for every admin action you do, repeat it with the other user account, the kind of lower user account. So again, if you're dealing with a forum and you've got posts, an admin should be able to delete posts, a user shouldn't. Um, and there's tools like Authorize, which can do this automatically as you click the buttons. There's a really great video, which I'll link below uh, from Stoke, which goes into way more detail about how to use that tool and how you can use it specifically to find these bugs. Okay, API 6, uh, 2019, mass assignment. Now this is something I have actually not really talked about before, but will be in my video next week. Binding client provided data, e.g. JSON to data models, without proper properties filtering based on a whitelist usually leads to mass assignment, either guessing object properties or exploring other API endpoints, reading the documentation or providing additional object properties and request payloads, allows attackers to modify object properties they are not supposed to. So what exactly does that mean? So let's say we're dealing with an API endpoint which changes your username. It probably shouldn't be able to also change your password, right? It should only have this one functionality. But actually, if you add password and email and whatever else in there, it will also change that property. Now, this tends to be when um, APIs are built on frameworks. So if you can find kind of built by whatever, built with, um, you tend to find this more often. Uh, but I'm going to actually show this in using kind of API for my API recon video in much more detail. So really do keep an eye out for that. Um, but essentially what you want to do is try different parameters and see if they work. You want to make sure they make sense for that endpoint though. Um, so there's some tools you can use to do that. And this is a pure recon bug. You should really be using tools to do this. Um, so add additional endpoints, see if anything changes. Like if you're dealing with a changed username, see if you can change other users, like the users, other properties, email, password, um, whatever you should be, you might be able to bypass checks like confirm password which is a really big deal when you combine it with something like xss because that's an account takeover right um so to kind of not to get too excited what does it mean an api endpoint will accept additional parameters even though it's not supposed to what are the signs of it um any kind of api built on a framework if you start to see like what might be default values in something, so you send a 
I don't know, a change email and you also have a parameter called username with your current username, which would be the default value. And how can you find it? It's recon next week. Talk about all about API recon in there. So that'll be really good. Uh, API 7 2019 security misconfiguration. Security misconfiguration is often a result of unsecured default configurations, incomplete or ad hoc configurations, open cloud storage, misconfigured HTTP he headers, unnecessary HTTP methods, permissive cross origin resource sharing, and verbose error message containing sensitive information. Um, so, what does that mean? It means whoever's managing the API, like the developer um, or DevOps, presumably, and made some mistakes when configuring the server, like by not updating it. Um, and what are really the signs? It's a lot of different bugs in here. It's not just one bug. It's actually a ton of different ones. Any kind of security misconfiguration is going to be more common with a smaller team because they don't necessarily have the expertise to be handling like big APIs with a lot of like complex technical difficulties. Um, so check for smaller teams, check for those private programs, etc. So how can you find it? Um, the first step is to learn the common misconfiguration bugs and how to exploit them. I've put some in the description for some examples of um, some nice ones. Cores and CSRF is a nice attack because that by essentially makes CSRF quite a nice attack even though it's disabled on some browsers at the moment because you can get data back from a CSRF. Usually you can only send it and hope the server does something with it. But with cores, you can actually get that data back. And there are some really cool bypasses of the same origin policy. There's like some really good write up. So I'll put those in the description so you can have a read of those. Uh, but fundamentally, this is a bunch of different bugs. So if you want to find these bugs, you're going to have to learn them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't get out of it. Um, API 8 2019 injection. So injection flaws such as SQL, no SQL, command injection, etc occur when untrusted data is sent to a interpreter as part of a command or query. The attacker's malicious data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or accessing data without proper authorization. So what does it mean? Uh, it's SQL injection. It's our standard kind of um, injection. You know, it's not just SQL injection. It's other like no SQL injection, for example. And there's no SQL map and SQL injection. There's SQL maps, a bunch of different um, types of injection um, vulnerabilities. Um, so basically, you use the API to run these payloads. And the reason why you might find them more in APIs than in kind of text boxes is because APIs often don't have the same level of filtering as something client side does which is really what makes APIs great to hack at the moment because there's a lot of them. They power a ton of stuff and there's actually not a lot of filtering. You can even get XSSs via uh, 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 via APIs at the moment because the API doesn't filter the data, but a text box does. Um, so the common signs of an injection bug is really on more common on internal, not for public use APIs, uh, where bugs just might have been left in quite a lot of the time. You find it in older applications, but actually they're kind of making a resurgence a little bit. IoT devices can be great for it. Um, anything where they don't expect a user to be able to interact with it tend to be great places for SQL injection um, or any other type of injection. So decide on the type of injection first to find it. So there's SQL injection, no SQL injection, um, and depending on what database they use. So SQL injection works on uh, like my MS SQL uh, and MySQL and PostgreSQL um, and they're kind of the more traditional database but NoSQL is these ideas of blobs and stuff like that. Um, so instead of the kind of tables and rows they kind of have these general ideas of data that's stored um, but they work a little bit differently so the injection is a little bit different. GraphQL has injections as well so you can actually find quite a few different injection payloads on payload all the things. They won't necessarily work first time. You might need to edit them, but that's a great place to start. So API 9, improper assets management. APIs tend to expose more endpoints than the traditional web applications, making proper and updated documentation highly important. 
proper host and deployed API versions inventory also play an important role to mitigate issues such as deprecated API versions and exposed debug endpoints. Um, whoops. So what does it mean? Even though version one of the API is still broken and full of bugs, it's still up and connected to the same data source. Um, they don't, deprecated API should be off limits, but actually often they're just left up. Um, if you ever see an API that has a version number in it, always change it. Like always go further down, see how many API versions there actually are. The endpoints might be slightly different with older APIs, but you can use a lot of tools to figure out what those endpoints might have been. Uh, the Wayback Machine is great for that. So how can you find it? Again, it's recon. It's a little bit of recon. Once you do find this like broken endpoint, you should be checking for all of the other bugs, injection, idols, excessive data, all of them. Bonus points if you find a disclosed report that still uh, works because the API has been left up despite it being fixed, uh, which would then bypass their fix and, and you'd have another one. Um, so finally, and this really doesn't apply to us, is insufficient logging and monitoring. Insufficient logging and monitoring coupled with missing or ineffective integration with an instant response allows attacker to further attack systems and maintain persistence. Pivot to more systems, tamper with, extract or destroy data. Most breach studies demonstrate the time to detect breach is over 200 days, typically detected by external parties rather than internal processes or monitoring. Um, it means that the defending team don't know what is being exploited and how. Um, if they don't have the logs, it can be really hard to detect the bad guys, let alone stop the bad hackers. This isn't really a bug bounty bug. It's way more of an issue on the other side. Um, one side might be utter confusion when you send in a report because they had no idea that API existed. There have been prizes at life hacking events, which is basically, huh, I didn't know we owned that. Uh, where you get extra money for finding something that they didn't even know they had control over, but somebody did. Um, which is probably the only bug that you could find. Like, it's just a bug that exists, and then you get this as a bonus. Um, it's something to be aware of when you report, though. It can really hate, help to demonstrate impact if you could do something really damaging without them noticing. Um, whether or not that's, like, specifically deleting stuff or just it doesn't exist in the first place it can really help say look your attacker was able to do this and if you didn't notice you'd be screwed okay so in summary i've included resources for each bug in the description you should be vaguely familiar with them all as you start api hacking um because you really need to learn the signs of bugs and then you can do the research to figure out how to do them. It's not necessarily a great idea to go, I'm only going to find XSS, I'm going to learn everything about XSS, um, when actually you'll miss like 30 idols because you're just focusing on XSS. Um, so recommendations. If you want to start bug hunting this weekend, if you're a beginner, idol, information exposure, improper asset management, really great three bugs, learn the signs, find them, exploit them. If you're into recon, mass assignment, information exposure, improper asset management are great ones for you. For a beginner, don't really bother looking at injection because it's quite rare. And when you do find it, it has to be quite specialized. Maybe just run a payload just to check. Uh, and insufficient logging because it's not really a bug. If you want to learn more about um, the API security project via OWASP, uh, there are some resources here. Again, linked below. Um, that go into more detail than this video has. So thank you very much for watching. Um, I know this is kind of not the video everyone wanted. Everyone wants the enumeration video. That's coming next week. Um, we're going to go really deep into API enumeration, how to do it. We're going to have loads of practical examples. And I really hope that you watch this video, maybe have a go. Then next week, when you have the API enumeration video, you can enumerate your API, find these bugs, you know the signs, you know how to hack it, you know have the resources. Maybe the API video just to kind of refresh yourself. And then that's it, first bug next weekend. So once again, this video was sponsored by Integrity. Um, I really hope you go and check out their bug bounty platform. And my username is or my link really is 
go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. Sign up. People have already told me they found their first bug on Integrity and that's amazing. That's brilliant. I really hope that happens to everybody else if you decide to sign up. Um, So thank you for sponsoring me and thank you very much for listening. And I will see you all next week with API enumeration.